And now, back to Around the Kid with Joe Ganses. Guys, we are back. I see my first guest on the line, and I'm going to play a little solo from him and then pick up the great Jimmy DeGrasso. Guys, we are back. That was a great solo for my first guest. It is my privilege and uh, a great time for the show to announce the great Jimmy DeGrasso. Jimmy, Joe Gans is around the kit. How are you, brother? Hey, what's going on? How are you, man? Thank you so much for giving me some of your time. I appreciate it. How you doing, Jimmy? Good. I, I thought this was the number to order a pizza. I guess I called the wrong number, huh? Well, what do you want, uh, pepperoni? Or you want? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> no, 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 I'm kidding. No, no, it's all good. Jimmy, if I could just start off by tell you how I came across you 29 years ago. I am a huge YMT guy. <laughs> I'll tell you what happened, and I'm, 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 I'm so glad it did. I'm a huge Y&T guy, loved Leonard Hayes. I loved the 80s stuff with uh, Mean Streak and Black Tiger forever. You know, all sure. the songs, of course. And then I buy the new album in 87, which is a great album called Contagious. And yep. something something wasn't right. I knew right away, you know what? That's not Leonard Hayes. It's not his style. And I turned the cassette over, and I'm like, oh, God, who's this guy? No. <laughs> and, brother, I am so glad that that happened to me. I have been a big fan. I have a Pearl Masters drum set. I know you're a Pearl guy, so I've been following you from everybody. I know you did some work with Ozzy. We'll talk about it, but I am a big fan, bro, and thank you for coming on my show. Yeah, sure, man. It's, 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 th- thanks for inviting me. It's all, it's all good. That's funny. Uh, <laughs> you're like, who's this guy? I love that. <laughs> who's this guy? <laughs> Yeah, I've done that a lot. That's all right, man. It's funny. Um, I want to go back because we're 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 sort of neighbors. I come from Staten Island, New York. You're in Pennsylvania, probably about two and a half hours away. I guess I'm not sure. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, you you grew up in the '60s, uh, early '60s, uh, and it it tells me two and a half years old you started playing. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, it was like a thing where, like a lot of kids. When they're young, I was beating on everything in the house, you know, like the pots and pans, the dog, the this, the that. And, uh, yeah, the dog thing didn't work out. Anyway, so they go, um, you know, my parents bought me, and you'll love, now this is going back, you'll love this because you'll get it. You know, they bought me a Zimgar kit out of the Sears mm. catalog, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and sure. that thing, you know, I don't know, I think that thing lasted three months, and I wrecked <laughs> that. So, um 
my dad got me uh, what at the time was a beginner set <clears throat> was a, a a blue mist Ludwig standard set. Cool. And uh, I got that, and you know, there was always music in the house. You know, my mom was always playing records. Remember those? Right. And yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> so <laughs> my mom always had on like music like uh, the Beatles and Elvis and Tony Bennett and uh, things like that and. Um, you know, some Motown stuff, you know, just a, a, a potpourri of everything at the time. So I right. just started playing along with the stuff, uh, you know, not knowing any better. And, you know, and it just kind of went on from there. And I started taking, you know, actual drum lessons when I was five. And, um, you know, just kind of, there was never any master plan or anything. I just did it because I liked it. It just was something that was fun to do, to, you know, put on records and play along with them and, you know, pretend you're in a band and all this stuff. So, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, so and that's and that's kind of how the whole thing started. So yeah, you're you're right. I know your father was a weekend musician. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, he was a. Uh, he used to play out um, more. You know, like weekends. He used to play a little bit of everything. I think he played drums. He played uh, some brass stuff. I I know he played some accordion, things like that. And uh, you know, it was when I was young. You know, we used to go to weddings and it was you know and then back then there wasn't DJs there was actual bands playing and I was always sort of mesmerized I'd go up to the bandstand and stare at the drummer because it was this cool like drum set and the chrome and the silver and the cymbals and it was loud and it was brash I'm like you know that was really really cool and then you know I think when I was five or six my dad got me my first Buddy Rich record and it just kind of kept going from there I was already into the Beatles and things like that and so yeah, you know it's 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 a real it's a real typical story of kids growing up in this kids growing up. I mean, I grew up in the late '60s, early '70s, so you know right. it's a thing where back then you know we didn't have the internet and computers and iPads and iPhones and you know we actually <laughs> didn't stare at a computer screen all day back then. So right. you know it was that was you know it was really if you were a kid. Back then, it was all about you know sports and or music or both, right? You know. Well, well, Jimmy, uh, a lot of seven-year-old kids don't have their first paid gig at seven. Talk to me about that. Yeah, that, <laughs> well, you did your homework. <laughs> there was a thing. Uh, my friend was, or my dad was friends with um, one of the professors at the local college, and um, they had a jazz trio that played out on the weekends and I guess their drummer couldn't make a gig and they asked my dad if I could do it. And it was pretty simple. It was just keeping time. Right. And so, you know, my dad said, yeah, sure. You know, he'll be love to do it. And so, and I didn't really know what to even expect. He was just like, just go along and play like you play along with like the Dave Brubeck records and just keep time and keep it simple and don't get in anyone's way. Like, mm -hmm. okay. Cause it was just, it was just a pianist and an up, upright bass player. And, you know, that's kind of what it was. It was real simple, and it was, you know, if you're seven years old, whatever it was, I mean, it's kind of fun because you get to stay up past 9 o'clock, and, you know, <laughs> you're, you're in a bar someplace, and, you know, it was sort of like a, I think it was like sort of like a jazz, easy listening bar, something like that at the time. So, yeah, it was fun, you know, and then it sort of, it started, it kept going from there. I started playing weddings and things like that when I think I was like, 11 or 12 and you know I always had gigs when I was in middle school and high school you know cool yeah guys we're so, talking to the great Jimmy DeGrasso Jimmy uh right there I want to stick to the 60s for a second why is Ringo so boring but why is he so tremendous in the same way give us your take on Ringo and why we we <laughs> think he's so boring I I think the guy was just tremendous for what he did Give us your take on Ringo. Well, it's, it's 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 really actually quite simple. I mean, you know, he he made the best parts for the best songs, and you know, he kept it. He played what he needed to play, and only that. And that's just that's kind of your role. You know what I mean? Right. That you're you're supposed to make the songs happen. You're not supposed to turn the songs into the drum solo. And you know, and obviously, with a band that great, with that great you know, th those great songs, you know, he made those songs happen. He just came up with the right parts. And, you know, and he had a nice swing to his playing. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 that was just, you know, like if, if you put the Beatles together 
now or 20 years earlier, it wouldn't be the same. It's just a thing. It's like a synergy where everybody meets at a certain time and everything just clicks. And that was a thing where they it, it just really worked. Everything, the songwriting and the melodies and, and, you know, American music scene at the time when they came over from the U.K., that that broke that whole thing open. You know, there is everything has to really line up in a row. And, you know, and his drumming was, those are just great drum parts. Yeah, you know, they're, great. I mean, they're all they're all doable. You know, it's funny, until you actually start down, and, you sit down and try to play some of those, you don't understand how good mm-hmm. they are. You yes. Know? Uh, so. so you, um, in the 60s and the 70s, you uh, you're pretty much a, a teenager in the late seventies. Give me one drummer who you really admired and uh, liked back then. Oh man, there's so many. It's, if I say if I say one and don't say the other nine <laughs> or something, and because some of these guys I know now, yeah, <laughs> to make somebody mad. I mean, it was sort of like it started with Ringo and it went to Buddy Rich, and then you know right. I did the, the Beatles thing and I did the big band thing for a while. That was I was really interested in that, and then. I started getting into the the rock stuff, obviously, like everybody my age at the time, and I was really into Aerosmith and Cheap Trick, and nice. and Zeppelin, and you know, I always I always loved Joey Kramer, and I always loved Bunny Carlos, and and then after, and then of course, and then Rush, and then I got into Neil Peart, and then after right. that, there's you know a couple guys following that I was really into. There's a guy named Barrymore Barlow that played with Jethro Tull mm-hmm. in the mid seventies. Love yeah, him. a brilliant uh, drummer. Uh, there was him. Uh, there was, you know, later on, there was, oh, then, then there was also, there was Tommy Aldridge. You know, then uh, there was Steve Smith. Uh, you know, like I said, the list goes on. But that was Steve really Dillon. about the ten guys that really yeah. I stole everything from. <laughs> 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 I won't say borrowed because I'm not giving it back, you know. I borrowed. No, you didn't. You stole. But that's okay. Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, so it was just it was it was just those drummers during that time period, and it, and it was sort of like you couldn't help it if those if you grew up listening to that music, those are the people that were going to influence you as a musician. And like I said, you know, I, I know most of these people now, so yeah, it's right. kind of yeah, it's kind of it's kind of interesting, kind of you know surreal at times. <laughs> Jimmy, take me uh, back to a time in your life. You know. Um, what were you thinking when you just decided, you know, I'm going to take my car, load my car up, and go out and try to live my dream in California? What was that part of your life about? Joe was about being completely naive and dumb. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when I'm, I, I'm, I actually, you know, I, I don't even know. You can't even. No, it was just like I, I don't I can't even believe it. I, I can't I can't believe some of the stuff. The ridiculous things I've done and somehow got away with. I mean, it, it was a thing where I had been playing in the tri-state area, and like, and you would know this well. I mean, I was around the you know the the Jersey scene, the scene in Pennsylvania, uh, the New York, you know, the Lemoors, the the right, Fountain sure. Casino. Um, I've been playing all those places and a lot of clubs, like I said, in Pennsylvania, going into Maryland and Delaware. And I was playing in, you know, a couple of different bands, and I was playing like five, six nights a week, and I was doing that from, who about three, four years straight, and, you know, playing mostly covers, and I said, okay, well, you know, I've got this down, and I thought, well, there's got to be something else. I mean, I wanted to be in, you know, a, a popular band and make records and videos and, and, you know, write songs and do all this other stuff, and, I you know, I, I didn't really find anybody during that time period back there I could play with and do that sort of thing. So I just decided to quit all those bands and just basically load up the drums in a van and drive to LA. And, nice. uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't, and with a couple of friends, I said, what are you doing? I said, I'm moving to LA. If you want to go, they're like, sure. <laughs> you know, the life decisions that are made, like in like, you know, the 10th of a second, I'm going to LA. You want to go? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like now, you know, now it's like you know, it's like a big plan. You know, you look on the internet and you make a plan. Now you just, right. yeah, I'm leaving in a month. You want to go? Yeah, sure. Well, let me just tell you, from a drummer to a drummer, I'm glad you made that journey. I mean, we can go on talk about your credentials. Leader Ford, you did Ozzy work with the Ultimate Sin, White Lion, Fiona, 
suicidal tendencies, Alice Cooper, David Lee Roth, the great Megadeth, Dawkins, you play with Rad, you probably play with my mother and father at one time, you know, uh, <laughs> just great stuff. Uh, talk to me about all these different people you played with. And I always wonder with a guy like you, you play with so many different acts, some different genres. Do you like freelancing or would you like to sign that contract with somebody and have a steady paycheck with the same person? Uh do I? I'm sorry. Do you go back to the the, the con- contract. I'm sorry, Joe. Well, what, do you, what, what, do you like again? doing you doing? Uh, are you like? Uh, do you like freelancing, or do you like to be with one group for a long period of time? I like. You know, it, it, that's a, that's a loaded gun. I mean, you know, at first you just want to when you're starting out, you just want to play with somebody that's known, and you want to be, you want to get exposure, and you just want to make records, and it's re- it's really a simple plan. You know, as you learn more about the business, you see the ins and outs of both. I mean, when you go play for somebody like an Ozzy or an Alice Cooper, basically you're a subcontractor. You know, basically, right. you know, you either do the tour and slash you do the record and you agree to, agree to terms and that's it. And you do it and that's fine. And, that's, and it's so funny because I know a lot of guys that were doing those gigs back in the day and – all they could ever talk about was getting out and starting their own band. And I would always be like, you know what? Careful what you wish for. <laughs> because <laughs> when you go out and you start your own band, basically what you're starting is your own startup business. And yeah. I've owned businesses, and believe me, they're not easy to start up and they're not easy to run, and bands are the same way. You know, you right. basically you have income and you have debt. <laughs> so, okay. And hopefully at the end of the day, <laughs> your income will be more than your debt. But most times... When you're in a band, you know, back in the day or even now, your debt is usually greater than your income. Okay. You know what I mean? Yes, sure. So, so there's something to be said. I mean, personally, I kind of like, I, when I look back at it, what I've done, I've gone, to, I've been in the band, then I've been a hired gun. Then I've been in a band, then I've done a hired gun again for a couple of years. And right. it just worked out that way because when you're in a band, you have, you're responsible for the bills, and, but you're also responsible for making the money. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't always work out where you actually make money because it's just, you know, tours are expensive. You might be touring at a deficit. But, you know, when you go play with somebody else, you get a weekly paycheck and you don't have to have any of the worries. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? So it's like Great all point. you have to yeah. worry about, and that's kind of sometimes I like that more, you know, depending on what the situation because all I have to worry about is showing up and playing drums every night which is right. great. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when you have a band, you know, before you actually play the gig, there's probably another eight hours of work and discussions and meetings and accounting stuff. And before that, you know, so it's like, because basically you're, you're the owner of a company. So, you know, it, it, they, you know, and but when it works out, it can be really rewarding. I'm just saying, right. you know, they both have their pluses and minuses. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of less stress if I'm correct. If you're a hired gun, no, yeah, certainly at in, times. In some ways. It's like because when there is a problem, or there are you know difficulties, or there's you know politics and you know whatever else, and tours have to be booked and budgets have to be done. None of that's your responsibility. You just show up, and that's Absolutely. and that's easy. Yeah, yeah, sure. Guys, we're talking to the great Jimmy DeGrasso six four six seven eight seven eight zero two seven. Jimmy, I've seen you so many times, and you are one of the best. I am not blowing smoke at clinics. Do you enjoy doing clinics? Is it something you look forward to? Oh, yeah, I've always enjoyed those. I mean, I I didn't do any for a while, then I did quite a few. Then I didn't do any for a while, then I did quite a few. I've, yeah, I've, I've always liked doing them. I think it's it's fun because, you know, when you go and you play gigs, you're not really – you know, you get the. You're supposed to play what you're supposed to play for the song. It's really not about you standing out. And I just try to keep the band together and play what's right for the song. Now, if you, when you go and do clinics, it's basically you can do whatever you want. <laughs> you can just go. Right, you right. can just go off on a tangent for an hour and play what you feel like, and hope hopefully somebody will enjoy it. But yeah, there's there's sort there's a certain release to doing that, and it's also fun to go out and just talk to people and young musicians and just hang out in a more intimate setting than an arena or a theater or an amphitheater or something like that. So, yeah, I, I do enjoy that. And, well, we, you know, 
you know, so it's it's all, and it's also fun when you do clinics. You just travel around with maybe one other person, if that, as opposed to like your whole entourage of like twenty five, thirty people in buses and all this planes and everything. It's just you go from music store to drum shop to music store to drum shop, and yeah, I think it's I think those are fun. Uh, I see so many guys that do clinics, and they could um, they could be great players, but they don't always convey themselves uh, directly and project themselves the right way in clinics. Some guys are just not good at, uh, at doing it. But I got to f- tell you, I watched you. I love the way you speak, and I love the way you break things down. Just a great job, brother. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. Um, Thanks very much. You're welcome. Um, do you – where am I right now? What am I doing? <laughs> Sorry, you you're making my that? pizza probably. <laughs> yeah, we're <laughs> – um, you know, Jimmy, we're always talking about the positives of people. We always want to talk about ourselves. But if you can honestly give me a negative about Jimmy DeGrasso. <laughs> oh, man, you'd have to ask somebody else about that. Um, <laughs> I'm sure they can come up with quite a few. Um, let me think. That's a good question. Um, and I, I don't mean no disrespect by it. No. No. Um, as far as my playing or my general demeanor, <laughs> uh, I think I I read you. You're, you're not really. How would you put it? Uh, a, a social guy or with a with 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 contacts and stuff like that. Um, oh, I know what I know. you read. Yeah. No, that's yeah. not necessarily what I meant. You know, there's guys. I, I know. I know what what quote you're you're talking about. Right. And in the context of what I was saying, I know there's guys. That, like, I'm I'm sort of, until I get to know someone, I'm pretty, like, quiet. I try to stay, I'm like a background person. Like, I don't okay. come into a room and start yelling. And I know guys, and, you know, God bless them, they're friends of mine. And they're constantly networking for other gigs. Right. While they have gigs, they network for other gigs. And it's, I've always thought that was sort of, like, like strange. Like, I you know, obviously... You always have to you have to maintain contacts and you have to and you should have other musicians for friends. I mean, a lot of mine are, but I don't really. I'm not doing a gig and then while I'm doing a gig, like looking at other gigs. You know what I mean? I've always I've always because that's what I was talking about. At, 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 okay. I think the quote you were reading, because yes. I've seen guys, um, you know, like while they were playing with someone, they're like talking to someone else, like, hey man, you know, like we should, you know, if you ever need somebody. <laughs> call me and I'm like wait a minute don't you already have a gig because I always thought that was like I never do that I think that's you know if I'm working with somebody I just work with somebody I think that's kind of disloyal you know what I mean like if you're right. already working and you're looking for something else to do or you know I don't know it's 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 a strange thing I mean I certainly keep in touch with people about doing different projects or working together in the future or things like that I just don't do it in the middle of a of the gig I'm already doing right. so right. I've always I've just always thought that was a little bit odd but you know teach his own Jimmy, um, you've been at this for over 30 years uh, on the national scene. How has the music scene and drums, drummers in general changed since the mid-'80s till now? Well, that's a, that here again, you know, it, the scene is pretty much different, and the music business is pretty much a small fraction of what it used to be. And it's a lot more difficult to do what we do today and it was 25 30 years ago. I mean there's no there's no infrastructure for selling a great many number of of sort of like I guess you want to say records or CDs or whatever because now the you know the the, the media forms are completely different, you know, downloads and streaming and you know uh, I don't know what the I I forget what the percentage of people that actually still buy a hard CD is these days, but it's it's nowhere near what it used to be. So so to put it in a nutshell, it's a lot harder to make a substantial amount of money. Okay. And, and that's why, I mean, because basically what, what you would do, like a lot of bands and the bands I've been in, you would go out and you would tour. And when you would tour, there's a lot of times you would tour at a loss. And the logic behind it with management companies and so on and so forth is like, well, even if the tour loses money, we make money in record sales. Okay, okay. Well, now there's no record sales, so right. you know, not enough record sales to merit touring at a loss. So, 
And a lot of people that were making tons of money off record sales aren't making it anymore because they just don't exist. And, of course, right. you know, there's all the discussion about, you know, Spotify this and streaming where the artists aren't even getting paid. They're getting paid, like, you know, a fraction of what they're actually entitled to. And there's all sorts of problems. I mean, it is it is really a, a broken business model, and that's why a lot of, you want to say classic rock or vintage artists don't even do records anymore because it doesn't, it, there's, there's just no point. Because right. – the amount of work you put in, it's it's hard to get that money back. You know, it's like you know, for the amount of time and money it takes you to do a record, how are you going to get that money back? So, right. you know, it's weird because the internet has made a lot of things. It's opened up a lot of things and made, you know, uh, things available to people that we, you know, it's much easier. But at the same time, it's kind of ruined a lot of things. I hate to say it. Sure. You know, absolutely. It's like the same thing. It's like years ago, I was, you know, thinking about we were going to do like a drum instructional video, and okay. we were, you know, and we we went over budgets and what it was going to cost, the amount of time. But at the end of the day, there was no way to really, and, you know, this is going back. I want to say seven, eight years ago, there was no way to basically selling unit one, and then a the day later it would be up on YouTube. <laughs> so how do you think, yeah. you have to chase all that stuff down so it kind of gets to a point where like why is it really worth doing with the amount of you know the costs and is it effective and, and all this, this other stuff yeah I, I think sometimes uh, the internet could be a positive and a big negative uh, uh, I talk to so many uh, drummers and they say the same thing and I think it's sad in a way but I guess you just have to you know, roll with the punches. Yeah, there's nothing you can do. I mean, it's like it, none, nothing that's a very – I mean, you you can chase – you know, you can hire a lawyer. You could take this stuff down. But as soon as you take it down, it goes back up the next day. And, you know, it's just it's just what it is, you know. It's it's like – it's sort of like banging your head against the wall. And it's it's you have to realize it is what it is, and you have to either reinvent yourself or work around it somehow. Yeah, it's like uh, – Choosing the better pizza, pepperoni or sausage? <laughs> yeah, and they've both been dropped on the ground. <laughs> Guys, we're talking to Jimmy DeGrasso. Jim, give me a couple minutes. Why why Pearl? I have two Pearl drum sets. I love Pearl. But tell me why Jimmy DeGrasso loves Pearl so much and the whole Pearl. Well, company. i got to tell you, I, I, I didn't want to interrupt earlier, but I don't play Pearl any longer. Okay, let me just go bang my head against the wall. <laughs> That's okay. No, well, you know what? It's funny because if you if you go on the internet, you'll still see a lot of shots and videos of me playing Pearl. But I've been playing. I went back to DW. I think like three years ago. Okay, my so my fault. I, I apologize. <laughs> no, it's okay. No, they make you know what they make fine drums, and we're still friends, and everything's good. I you know. Over the over the what was it thirty? Well, God, it's been like thirty years now. Over the thirty years, I think I've been with four companies. Or actually, okay. I've only been with three three companies. I started out, I believe, in the mid '80s. I was with Yamaha, and right. I played Yamaha for a couple of years. And you know, here's the thing: it's funny it, regarding drum endorsements. You know, when you're coming up and you don't have a lot of money, that's when you need an, an endorsement. You know, I want new drums, I need this, I need that, I need the other thing. And then when you start doing records and all this other stuff, then people want to give you stuff. It's like, well, I kind of needed it two years ago, you know. Right. So then when you have money for it, they want to give it to you. But, you know, it's still the same. So, you know, I started out with Yamaha, and that was fine. They made you know, they made good drums back then. I don't know what they're doing now. And um, – but they were really into their jazz guys at the time, and obviously I was playing more rock, and they really weren't that into the rock guys. And I decided I went a year without a drum deal. I just didn't want one because I was learning at the time. You want to be with a company that you have a good rapport with because if they're just going to give you a bunch of drums, it's just not worth it. I'd just rather buy my drums. Right. So I didn't have a drum deal for about a year, and then I – was talking to John Good and Chris Lombardi one day. This is like in 1988 or 89, and they were starting to make drums. And then they um, they uh, wanted me to try their drums because I was already playing their pedals at the time. And so I was probably one of the first ten guys that signed with DW to play their drums back in like I think it was 88. 
Cool. So I played their stuff for a long time. I played it for um, all through the YNT, Suicidal, Alice Cooper, right into the Megadeth thing. And I think I left in 98 or 99. So I stayed there like 10, 11 years. And then I went to Pearl for, uh, you know, some different reasons. And I played their stuff for about till 2000. 12, I think, 2012 or 2013, and then I decided just to go back to uh, DW. Okay. My apologies. <laughs> no, it's okay. No, it's, it's, um, it's all good. It's just, you know, it's fine. Yeah. Give me a couple of minutes on Wayne's World. <laughs> um, yeah, that was, that was one of those funny stories where you go, I'd just gotten back from... Alita Ford tour, and I think this is like September of October of 91, and um, somebody from Alice's management called me and go, listen, we need a drummer to come down to Universal Amphitheater for two days and just play this one song for this movie. And I'm like, what movie? And he said, this thing called Wayne's World. It's a, it's a takeoff on this skit on Saturday Night Live. And I'm like, yeah, sure, I've seen it. And um, she's like, yeah, sure. I, I, had like, I think I had like four days off, so I went down to L.A., and we just basically hung around Universal Amphitheater for two days and just played the song a handful of times, and I left. And I, you know, I had no idea that it was going to be this huge sort of like cult classic, you know, in the yeah. '90s. But you know, it was it was fun. It was, uh, like I said, it was just, it was like an afterthought. It was just a way to kill a day or two when I wasn't on the road. And then you know, it came out like six months later, and it wound up being this big smash hit. It's still on. It's still I still see it on like you know different cable channels you know on our oh, yeah. on our satellite plan every now and then it shows up Jimmy I got one more and I just wanted to say thank you for this time um you know I always like to know what goes on in, in some drummers minds if you had one drummer to pick that you would love to you and him go back and forth in a room and play past or present just one guy you'd love to have a little conversation with with the drums who would that one guy be as far as just talking to or playing with? I mean a conversation with the drums, you you know, back yeah. and forth, like a little battle, you know? I've had, you know, it's, oh, man, that's a that's a good question. You know, I've had, uh, not the, most of the people, and, and this is, in a way, I've been very fortunate. Most of the people, like I said earlier, the guys I grew up, up with, I've, I know most of them now, and I've had the opportunity to sit down with most of them and talk and actually even play with some of them. Cool. And yeah, it's like, it's really, it's been really, uh, it's been really surreal to, in that sense. And, um, you know, it's, it, boy, one guy, I mean, there was so many Buddy of Rich. them. <laughs> no, I, you know, I actually met B Buddy Rich when I was, cool. um, seven years old, I, I think. Right. And, uh, he, um, he was playing at Moravian College in Bethlehem, and my dad took me to see him. And, of course, he was brilliant, and before the show, I got his autograph. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, but, yeah, I can't tell you one guy, because, I mean, they've, it was, oh, man. That's so hard. I'll, you know what? I'll call you back when you're having a show with somebody else, and I'll interrupt your show. And I'll just and I'll call in and I'll just yell a name and I'll hang up. That's it. That's it. Just yell me. And you'll go, who the who the hell was that? You know. That was the know. pizza guy. And I'm like, the, I'll just I'll like I'll call in and I'll yell Elvin Jones and hang up. And you'll go, who's the guy that just yelled Elvin Jones on the radio show? That you know? that's somebody. That's... <laughs> Jimmy, uh, I appreciate this time. Um, anything you want to plug now? Or tell us what you're doing in, in the near future. Um, I just got back from, I was in Europe and England for the last couple of months. I just did a Black Star Rider tour, and we were uh, touring with Def Leppard and White Snake. So I just got back from that about a month and a half ago. So uh, really, right now, I'm just kind of hanging low. It's kind of some time off. So uh, I'm just plotting out the next move to make this year, and I really don't know what it is yet. So, But like I said, I've only been home since like Christmas time, so I'm not in... I'm not in a big rush, but we'll, you know we'll we'll see what pans out. But like I said, Black Star Writers was the last thing I'm doing, and we're not we're not touring it all this year. We're going to do a new record, I think, in the summer at this point. So that's like the next thing we're looking forward. But that's that'll be here before you know it. 
I wanted to ask you a question about a song. Did you ever play Barroom Boogie live? Yeah, we used to do that a lot. Oh, yeah, I mean, there's, I, there's, I'm sure there's a couple versions on YouTube, but yeah, we played that all the the time. That was one of the staples of, of our set going back then. Uh, I remember I, I I heard you do like Midnight in Tokyo and Forever and. Just your spin was uh, different than Lennon, but you brought it to a new level. Jimmy DeGrasso, I thank you, brother, for this time. You're a gentleman, and I hope down the road we could do it again. Jimmy, I asked my guests at the end one question and their answer. I do not de- uh, debate it. On a scale of 1 to 10, brother, rate this interview. <laughs> uh on on my end or, or your end? Uh, how did I do to you? How did the How did the pizza man do tonight? You were Joe. I swear to God, you you were a ten. You were spot on. Hey, I want I wanted to ask you something. Has anyone Good. ever called and and been as prompt as as I, gotta, as I was? I I gotta be honest with you. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's why I messaged you. I'm like, are we taping? Or are we going live? And you're like. I'm on the radio right now. I'm like, okay, I got to be on time then, because well, I didn't know. Because some guys tape, you know what I mean. So I'm like, well, yeah. if I call and he's taping, it doesn't matter. But you're like, well, no, I'm live. Call at nine twenty. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, real fast. <laughs> it's like, uh, my whole life before I let you go, my whole life is about time, brother. If I got to be at a wedding, I got to be on time, 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 and it goes back to my drumming. Are you like that? Yeah, I mean, my my motto was like, if if you're on time, you're you're late. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> like, like I'm the guy. I'm the guy. Like, if you're on tour and there's a 9 a.m. bus call, yeah. If you're if you're if you if you're there at 9:01, that will drive me insane. <laughs> I hear you. Like, and you know, like, oh, I had to dry my hair. Yeah, I don't care. Let's go. <laughs> you, know, you know, oh, I was I, I had to wait for my Starbucks to cool off. It's 9:01. <laughs> you're late. You know. Well, See, certain Jimmy, bands, uh, if you're a minute late, we will oil spot you. You know what that is? I'm going to find out. Go ahead. That's when, if you're late for lobby call, the bus leaves. <laughs> and it's like, you stop running. So we'll, we'll, we'll be on our way to, to Chicago, and we get a, so a guy will call like half hour like in, into the ride. It's like, hey, I'm in the lobby. Where is it, everybody? We're on the way to Chicago, man. Like, what? <laughs> You might Jimmy, you might want to you might want to look into the Greyhound schedule. Yeah, and uh... <laughs> <laughs> or you, you might want to call Uber. I don't know if Uber <laughs> drives from state oh, to God. state, but <laughs> Jim, I, I I can't thank you for this time, brother. I hope down the future we could do it again. God bless sure, you man. and All good. good luck, man. Thank you so much, you, brother. You know my number. You call me if you need a, a, anything. Thank you, brother. All right, man. You be be safe. Thanks, man. Have a good night. All right, All right you too.